Hey, this is Seth at Music Teachers Muse. Tune in Friday's PST at midnight for new episodes. See you there. All right, welcome back. Today we're talking about when the music doesn't matter because you're playing counselor and being a confidant to your students. So once you've had a student for a reasonable amount of time, they're more than just a student. They can be, they can become a friend. I'm, I don't hang out with them often, but I'm friends with several students who don't take lessons with me anymore. I hang out with them a couple times a year, but I keep in touch with them. They always want to know what I'm up to musically. They support my, you know, my independent YouTube channel where I just do my performance stuff. And uh, they're just really appreciative of everything I did for them as a teacher, and they become, they become good friends of mine. But um, when you have a student you, you're working with continually for a long period of time, they, you, know, you get to know them as a person. You don't just have, you're not just their music teacher. You're, you're somebody who teaches them music who they confide in about other areas of their life because it's really impossible to not get that. If you, have, if you have a student for a long period of time, they're obviously comfortable enough with you that they want to keep continuing that. If they didn't, they'd go to another teacher or they quit entirely. So the first thing you want to keep in mind when it comes to this is since most of your kids are children, keep in mind that the, the more that they trust you, the more they will confide in you with what's going on in their lives. And sometimes you'll just be in the lesson and they'll be like, they won't, they won't talk much to be like depressed or sad about something. And you want to make sure that you, you try to get done what you're being paid to do, but some days you can't focus on the matter at hand, which is playing whatever song or, or part or piece of music that you were working on previous. And you try to get them to open up a little bit because you know something's wrong where they not don't want to play or it's literally just not on the table for today. Now you have to approach it delicately because as we've talked in previous episodes about kids deal with so much today, I can't even imagine being even a five or a 10 year old in today's environment because it was stressful enough for me being a teenager in the 90s. But uh, kids are overworked before they ever have an actual job. They're, they've got hours of homework a night. They might be a, in a single parent environment. I never dealt with that. My folks have been together 50 years. I never had to deal with that at all. Um, so I have no idea what that's like. You know, they might have a nanny at home versus see their folks on average because their folks work so much. Uh, they, you know, they've got stress dealing with family and the, what they deal with at school. They, they live online, so they deal with the cyberbullying shit. And they're just, there's so much that they have to deal with. You want to approach this very delicately because unless they know you fairly well, they probably won't open up to you. But if they do, just listen and be cool and just try to identify with them as much as you can because the stresses that they face are nothing like we did. When, uh, but we can empathize with them because we can understand how most of that would feel. Even if, we, if, even if I don't understand how, because nobody's ever cyber bullied me. I mean, I've had people call me an asshole on Facebook, but who hasn't by now? Because, you know, just people's favorite thing to do is troll on there and, and be online pricks. Their balls are big as church bells are online, but they never say that to you in person or, to your, or over the phone because they just don't have the, the, to quote my dear departed friend Nick Appel the testicular fortitude to be able to pull that off because they literally don't have the balls to do it. But, uh, but I can understand how it would make a kid feel because, you know, like their online Instagram or their, most young kids aren't on Facebook anymore. They think that's for old people. But uh, seriously, I've had young kids say that. But uh, they're on TikTok and Twitter and all that other shit. But, um, but literally, it's, you can empathize that it would really hurt them to have somebody make fun of them online because if they have a bunch of friends that share the same you know, group of friends on there, then, then it gets out that they're this, that, or whether it's true or not. And you know, kids have sadly you know, committed suicide over it. And uh, it's, it's a serious thing. So you just want to be aware that that's all shit that they deal with and just try to be as empathetic as possible and identify that they just want somebody to talk to about it. And the more that you are able to do that, it shouldn't be, unless it's a kid with a lot of serious problems, it shouldn't be a real common occurrence. 
it's usually pretty rare when I have to ask them if they want to talk about something because they're kind of not in the zone that day. So make sure that after a certain period of time, if it's just not flowing like you want it to, that you know something's wrong and you've got to attack it from a different perspective. You don't want to spend a bunch of time either trying to coax something out of them that's not going to happen because they're just not into it that day. It's, just, it's the same idea of you don't want dead air in the room like if you're at a gig. You don't want dead air on the mic for more than a few seconds because it's, it's not good. It makes you look bad and you don't want the parent thinking that nothing's happening in the room. So you got to make sure that you fill that time with something productive or that helps the situation. The, the other thing you want to make sure too is when that does happen that you just, depending on how delicate the matter is, if it's something the kid is okay with their folks knowing about, they might not know. Chances are that they're not going to tell you something so secretive that they wouldn't talk to their folks about it. Their, their folks probably already know. If it's something the kid is okay with you mentioning to them, but you just want to make sure that you tell them he had a rough day and there's obviously something bothering him, you might not even tell them what it is because the kid probably will anyway. Like I've, I've personally never had a kid confide in me that they were molested or anything like that, but I mean, it does happen. One of my uh, classes I had, I didn't take a class, but to get a teaching job, I had to attend a, uh, some kind of a seminar or some sort of training to spot when that was a thing so that I could report it if it was suspected that that was happening within the teaching environment. And it was very informative and uh, I'm glad I did it because I, it helped me become a better educator. I've never ever had a kid, thank God, tell me that that was going on and if it was I didn't know. But, I, but I've also never had a kid in a room that was like that distraught over any of life's BS. But, uh, but again, they deal with more than we ever did as kids, so you just have to make sure that you're, you're being cool and that you're conveying that you care and that you just want to listen and you can try to help them feel better about it. So that's definitely one of the main ways that you're just a confidant. The other way is this, I mean, there's several ways it can go, but that's when there's like an emotional problem or the student is overwhelmed with something. You feel like more of a friend to them than you do a teacher because they can confide in you as something besides music. And the more comfortable they are with you, the more it's going to be something that they respect you for and they want to continue lessons with you longer. Now, I don't have a lot of extra to add to this episode because that's the main idea. This is that your students are comfortable with you enough to confide in you about something besides the general interaction of, hey, here's how you play this, here's, here's your answer to this question. But I do have one amazing example of how I was able to help a young kid some years ago at the stores. I mean, his name was Cameron, and he'd been a student for six months to a year or something, and he came in all bummed out, kid's like 14 years old. And I'm like, dude, what's wrong? And he had this girl that he was seeing who was all messed up and she was at the age of 15 or 16 was already a drug addict and had all kinds of problems with that and was in and out of foster homes and and juvie and all this other stuff and she was messing around on him and I happened to remember my own personal experience because I didn't have anything like that but I did I was with a girlfriend who was an alcoholic for a lot of years and it's the most selfish person I ever knew, and I was dealing with it in my 30s. This is a kid half my age or less. And so I just mentioned to him, I'm just direct and blunt with him. I said, I'm dealing with this at my age now, and so I'm going to help you out here. And I just told him, I said, I literally looked at him and said, do you think she gives a shit how it makes you feel when she's messing around on you with other guys? Because she don't. You're just, you, as long as she knows you're going to put up with her shit, you're gonna, she's going to keep you around because no matter what she does to you, you're going to take her back every time. You're you're her emotional tampon. And that's what he was. And I've known, I mean, I've been that guy. Not anymore. I don't do it. But, you know, I know a lot of guys who have been because it's, you know, it's just an easy track to fall into. And I remember it was just, it was so great because he was just like, he, was, he just sat there with that, that look on his face for a minute or so. And he just looked at me and said, thank you. No one else has been that direct and that blunt with me and just told me straight up how it is 
because they were too afraid to hurt my feelings. And I'm like, well, you're welcome, dude. And I went home and I told my roommate, and I said, I did a good thing today. And the next time I saw that kid, he came into the store and personally made it his mission to find me and told me he dumped that sack of shit bitch and got him a better girl. So that was a major win and I felt so good about that. And from then on, I've considered myself a somewhat of a counselor as well as a music teacher. And it's made the job more rewarding because I saved that kid a ton of grief and he automatically bettered himself because he took my advice and, you know, made his life better. So I don't have much more to add to that. There's not a lot of recap here, but just remember, empathize with the student, be accommodating, and just like when they're being difficult and they're having a bad day, just make sure that you are uh, as cool as possible and just try to remember they go through a lot. Even your adult students will confide in you about their personal lives after a while, but the kids are the ones you have to be extra sensitive about. And it's just something that we all should be aware of as educators. So thanks for tuning in and watching. Please hit the bell for new videos. Subscribe, like, share. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Check out our sponsors in the description below. And we will see you next week.